the 17th of June? Yes. Okay, well, we missed you. Sorry. Let's sing to Randy today. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. July. Yeah. Oh, you will be. Oh, okay. Well, we'll sing to you today. Happy birthday. I just want to say a quick thank you to all of you here and all of you at home. Uh, June was remarkable for our contributions to Feast, uh, the food pantry at Trump Bowersville. Uh, the month of June, we were to do cereals. We collected and distributed to them 71 boxes of cereal. They were <laughs> terrific. Um, we also contributed 30 containers of mustard, ketchup, and, and mayonnaise that they said they might need, especially for 4th of July, and six containers of, quart containers of non-refrigerated milk. So that was a great way to start. They're thrilled. Um, the couple of the workers were particularly happy with the fact that the freshness of the product that we're giving them is not in question, which is a big deal. So thank you. And I would like to remind you that the month of July is canned meat. Uh, that's the next big category that they need. Tuna, spam, chicken, um, also you know, relishes and pickles they, they are asked for, as well as the condiments as well. Um, so uh, we've got a kind of a, we've set the, the mark pretty high starting <laughs> off uh, the first month. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do for the canned meat program, but I'm sure we'll We'll meet that goal and we'll take care of it. So, but they're really, really thrilled. Um, I can tell you that just going over there, the people waiting in line to, to take advantage of the pantry um, are a lot of retired folks. And you can tell the kind of, you look on their face, it's really strained. So there's the pressures of day-to-day -day living with the economy and the cost of things, whatever is really weighing on people. So. Uh, believe me, that what you've donated is, is well appreciated, and as we keep going on, I think that we're just going to build and build on the reputation of being able to take care of more and more folks. So again, thank you. Which segues nicely to my next announcement, because we are having our joint cluster service on the 21st here. It will be an outdoor service, weather permitting. Um, I know the folks from... Uh, Christ from Morrisville, St. John's, Switzerland Town, and uh, St. Paul's Apple Boxville are all planning on joining us for worship. So we're looking forward to it. Also, how we're going to be handing the offering. We're going to do a free will offering to benefit the Code Blue Shelter. So here's how that's going to work, especially if anyone wants to buy gift cards for, you know, whether it be like, you know, McDonald's, a fast food place, Wawa, Walmart, anything like that. You know, so they have something to hand out to people. Your normal Sunday offering, if you would, Give it either the week before, the week after, whenever. You know, so that way each church is going to maintain their own offering. Whatever is collected that Sunday is going to go to the Code Blue Shelter. Any questions? I see a lot of head nodding. It's a good sign. <laughs> Pastor Sue is on vacation through today. She'll be back, she'll be back tomorrow. <coughs> Do you have any other announcements? Lita. As you are all aware, um, I, myself, um, Janet, and Steve Potsko, we're working on the transition committee. We're getting close to wrapping up our evaluation of our current uh, situation, our needs, our wants, and what we want to present for any potential um, new pastors. So you should have an insert in your bulletin. This will be in um, every week for the month of July, but only fill out one survey. 
and it's for us to get your input so that you are involved with our decisions. What are the top five priorities that you see that we want to present to any potential pastor candidates? What we would like them to be strong in? Um, so what are the five top minister priorities that you see listed here? Um, <coughs> make sure you just fill out one time. If you have any questions, you can talk to myself or Steve or Janet or a member of council. Um, but we want to get your input. We're going to collect all of this for the month of July, compile that, and in August, we'll wrap up the last few things. We hope to have the whole ministry profile completed in September so we can hand that off to council and they can start their next process. Thank you. So also when you have it filled out, just you can either put it in the offering plate, you, you can put it in my mailbox down there, or hand it to a member of council or the transition team. If you know of anyone who is not going to be attending worship would like one of these or anyone who's viewing online needs a copy, you can always call the office and make sure you get one. Are there any other announcements for the good of the order? <coughs> Hearing none, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship and the music of our prelude.
Good morning, church. Good to be back here again. Seems like it's been a very long time. I, I don't know, but it's good to be with you here again this morning. I would like to invite you now, please stand as you are able for the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Amen.
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from Ezekiel 2, verses 1 through 5. A voice said to me, Mortal, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord. Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We'll now read responsibly for, uh, Psalm 123. I'll read the light verse. Congregation, please read the bold verse. To you I lift up my eyes, to you enthroned in the heavens. And to the eyes of servants to look to the hand of their masters, and the eyes of the maids to the hand of their mistresses. So our eyes look to you, O Lord our God, until you show us your mercy. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy, for we have more than enough of contempt. Too much of the sworn of the people of the rich. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weakness. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I will refrain from it, 
so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me. Even considering the exceptional nature of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Word of God, word of life. the sixth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and, not, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them and he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out about among the villages teaching. He called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, Stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. How many of us are familiar with the old saying, familiarity breeds contempt? I'm pretty sure our gospel reading today fits that to a T. So I got to thinking, what is it about the human condition that makes it far easier to tear someone down rather than build someone up? What is it that many times causes us to be jealous of someone else's success or accomplishments? What makes us look at someone and not be able to give he or she the credit that is due them? And finally, why is it that those who know Jesus best turn on him when his words make them feel uncomfortable? These are the types of questions that run through my head each time I read this passage from Mark, and for good reason. If you recall from our recent readings from Mark, Jesus had stilled the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Then he healed the Gerasen demoniac by sending the demons into 2,000 pigs, plunging them into the sea. 
Then while Jesus was in Capernaum, he healed a woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. And immediately following that healing, Jesus raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. It's pretty apparent Jesus has done some pretty amazing things and word got around. Now Jesus comes home and his hometown folk won't receive him because they know him. One would think that the hometown crowd would be proud of their homegrown prophet, but alas, not so much so since the human condition I mentioned earlier gets in the way. But then again, folks can be just as easily dismissive of a prophet because they're not from here, or as an outsider, they have no right to speak. Remember our first reading from Ezekiel? I want to reread the first six verses of our gospel reading, but this time from the message translation because I think it brings clarity into the situation. He left there and returned to his hometown. His disciples came along. On the Sabbath, he gave a lecture in the meeting place. He stole the show, impressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good, they said. How did he get so wise all of a sudden and get such ability? But in the next breath, they were cutting him down. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude, and Simon, and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell, sprawling, and they never got any further. Jesus told them a prophet has little honor in his hometown among his relatives on the streets he played in as a child. Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything there. He laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. That's all. He couldn't get over their stubbornness. He left and made a circuit at the other villages, teaching. I believe Mark's account nails it as he reveals the human condition each one of us carries, sin. Jesus' hometown folks are, I would suspect, willing to give him the benefit of the doubt as long as he doesn't say anything unexpected or challenging. They would not be inclined to doubt the source of his teachings if he had not made them feel uncomfortable. Their response to whatever it was he said reflects a combination of belief and cynicism. They seem to believe that what he is saying is of divine origin. What is this wisdom that has been given to him? Yet they are unable to believe that such a great gift would be given to someone they know and whose family they know. Here are a few possible thoughts that may have been going through their minds. How dare he have something we don't? How could someone this powerful have grown up in our midst and we not know about it? Or perhaps they could not reconcile the ordinary with the extraordinary and felt shown up somehow by comparison. When you think about it, all these thoughts have a common focus on themselves. And here's the rub. Truth be told, when we are focused on ourselves, on maintaining our superiority and control over our surroundings and others, we are not open to the truth God seeks to speak to us, sometimes through people we know and in places we thought we knew, like the back of our hand. Ultimately, what didn't happen in Nazareth is not much of a surprise then. A miracle is not just an event but it is an interpreted event. If Jesus is not regarded to be capable of healing, any healing that does happen won't be attributed to him. So there's nothing to see here, move along, just move along. And because of this rejection, Jesus does move along. He goes into the other villages and begins teaching, but he doesn't do it alone. His disciples go with him and Jesus sends them forth to preach repentance, heal the sick, and cast out demons. But what strikes me as odd is the business about all the things that are not supposed to be taken along, but rather for them, 
to become totally dependent on God to provide for their needs through the generosity of those that they meet along the way. Now I have to admit, I am what you might call a defensive packer. I pack for what ifs, hoping to be prepared for any eventuality in terms of weather or occasion. I take an extra pair of everything along just in case, so I don't leave anything to chance. And nine times out of 10, when I get back home from a trip and unpack, I find that I haven't used nor worn much of what was in my bags. So traveling light, as Jesus calls his disciples to do today, certainly sounds kind of foreign to me, especially since you and I know it wasn't just an ordinary weekend getaway they were headed for, not given the potential danger Jesus was asking them to walk into. In fact, we've already heard that those who had heard Jesus in the synagogue were more than skeptical about his origins. And that in spite of his ability to heal and perform miracles, believing was beyond their grasp. And yet, Jesus sends his followers out into the world in a state of utter vulnerability. I wonder if they were surprised when they realized the gift they had received without being encumbered with stuff. Now it is true, of course, that you and I live in a much different time than Jesus and his disciples. It is true that perhaps hospitality to stranger played a larger role in that place and time. So it was more likely that their needs would have been met regardless of what they hadn't packed for themselves. It is also true that Jesus' disciples didn't know nearly as much as we do that we feel compelled to carry with us wherever we go. Even so, Jesus' words always get me thinking, and for that reason, I know they still speak. And so I wonder, what are we missing when we fail to acknowledge our total dependence on God's along life's way? Indeed, I wonder sometimes just how much our baggage gets in the way. When we focus our attention on guarding our belongings, are we less able to reach out with a gesture of kindness to another? When we rely on our own careful planning for everything, do we then become less open to what surprises God might have waiting for us? If we already have everything we need, are we less able to receive the gifts of those we meet along the way? So perhaps Jesus sending the disciples out traveling light makes perfect sense after all. Maybe this is especially true when we are sent with the good news as the disciples were, so that both those who are sent and those who are receiving would more fully be able to receive the gifts of God. We as Christians should know more than anyone how very dependent we are on our amazing God. And we should not be afraid to express and acknowledge that truth and to invite the world to depend on God as well. Beloved, we do have one thing those disciples did not, and it makes all the difference. We have experienced the faithfulness of God in Jesus crucified and risen. So we may marvel at the unbelief around us, but still we go forth, proclaiming and practicing our faith and dependence on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the one who can do all things but fail, amen.
Let us profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> One in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. Glorious God, you bend down to wash the feet of your disciples. Let the servant church arise in our teaching, our praying, our healing, and our doing. Make all your faithful people powerful in weakness and strong in grace. In your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Life-giving God, your fingers trace the heavens, and your hands mold the earth. Where there is drought, bring nourishing rain. Where there is devastation from fire or flood, bring relief. Sustain the well-being of every living thing. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, you speak, and the nations listen. Open those who govern to the cries of all who journey with no food or shelter particularly people fleeing violence, those seeking freedom, and those in search of community. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, your embrace brings wholeness to those who are troubled. Anoint in all who suffer in any way with the oil of healing and grant them their renewal. We pray especially for Dorothy Brinkman, Noel Brooke, Suzanne Christman, Lily Mae Funk, Renee Georgiatis, Diane Gushi, Chester Hartley, Arlene Hartley, the family and friends of Michaela Kramer, the family and friends of Marcia Niedinger, John Schwartz, the family and friends of baby James Tolliver, Sally Tuchiris, Stanley Weigel, Barry Weston, Give both Bishop Patricia Davenport and Bishop-elect Byron Penman wisdom and peace as they look forward to their leadership transitions in the coming months. In your mercy, welcoming God. In your presence, strangers become companions and enemies become neighbors. Open our doors to those we have so easily shut out particularly people who are different from us and who are marginalized by church or society. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Righteous God, when we have difficulty in trusting, ground us in your love for all creation. Give us the assurance that we are truly united in that love with you and all people. In your mercy, hear our prayer. All-knowing God, guide our council, transition team, and all congregational leaders as we journey through the interim period at St. John's. Open the eyes of all to recognize and trust in the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide us in your mercy. Your yeah. prayer. Eternal God, you gather us into your house of many dwelling places. We give you thanks for our faithful departed. Inspire us by their lives of faith until with them we rest forever at our journey's end. In your mercy, in our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Let us share with one another a sign of God's peace.
the blessings of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Be to God.